When a journal belonging to a serial killer is discovered, their darkest thoughts come to light, and finding your name inside is a death sentence. Written in Blood, the heart-stopping new thriller from number one best-selling author Chris Carter. Frank's strength was his charisma, brilliant talker. His personality was infectious. I loved to associate with busy people who have a drive in their life to achieve something. And here he was, this international banker, and he needed prayer. Lay preacher Paul Owens first met Frank Nugent at morning communion at Sydney St Andrew's Cathedral. One morning I noticed this very debonair character, beautifully dressed, down on his knees and uh, in, in deep prayer. But he was in there probably twice a week. And then one day, both of us were sort of walking out, out of the church, and I put my arm around him and I said, look, it's not as bad as all that. And he said, uh, Paul, what about lunch today? And uh, he said, I'm going to take you up to the Bourbon Steakhouse up in King's Cross for lunch. And that was the beginning of our association. Paul Owens became a regular visitor to the Nugenhand headquarters in Macquarie Street. The office was busy, people coming and going, and uh, it was a huge enterprise. There were phones going, telefaxes going, very professional staff. The place was electric. You sort of connected that there was something going on there that was pretty big. He was just a man that was in need. We'd say the Lord's Prayer together, you know, which he knew. And then I'd pull out an appropriate Bible verse, which, which seemed to help. And uh, one particular occasion, when I was in his office, uh, we were praying for this and that, and uh, he said, have you ever seen a million dollars written out in a check? I said, no. And he said, well, there it is. And he wrote out a million dollars, took it out and, and gave it to one of the girls. So I sort of um, <laughs> wondered what on earth have I struck here? A lot of narcissists, I believe, what little bit I know, once they realize that they can't sell the program anymore, they become destructive. I really believe that Frank Nugent probably became crazier than a shed house rat. Frank Nugent was prepared to offer $50,000 to anyone who could compromise me as Attorney General. In 1978, $50,000 was a sizable amount of cash, enough to purchase a three-bedroom home on a quarter-acre block in Sydney. It could also rent a hitman. In Hong Kong, Doug Sapper received a message that Bernie Houghton was in town. The King's Cross bar owner had joined the bank and was setting up branches in the Middle East. I didn't particularly feel warm and fuzzy towards Bernie Houghton. It wasn't like we were going to dinner and dancing. Bernie Houghton was a fixer. He had a couple of hard cases with him when he came to visit Michael. It was suggested that I could help them with their problem. Sapper dined with the two rough-looking Australians at a noodle bar. They had a proposition for him. They'd heard about Sapper's exploits while working in Cambodia when two local men followed him from his office at the airport and seemed intent on killing him. So he drew his pistol and shot them both dead. They said they were looking for someone with Sapper's skills for a job back in Sydney. They just told me they could make arrangements to get me into Australia and that they'd get me out. Why do you have to come all the way to Hong Kong to try to find a hitter? Yeah, no, excuse me. You can go down to King's Cross and get a pimp to do this. I go to Australia and I do the job. Now, there's only one loose end that hasn't been tied up. Me. They just shoot you through the head, leave the body in the lobby of the government building. And I wasn't even going to have that conversation with these guys. Sorry, guys, you got. I don't have the skills to do that. I'm, you're talking to the wrong guy. They didn't tell Sapper who they were planning to kill. He had no inkling that Frank Nugent's political enemy, Frank Walker, fitted the bill or that Nugent had put $50,000 on the Attorney General's head. Doug Sapper already had concerns about where Nugent Hand was heading, but they were amplified by the thought that it was getting into the business of murder. Sometimes I think when people are dumping money on a table or they're giving you a briefcase full of money, I think somewhere along the line you get caught up in the excitement, so to speak. And maybe what would have passed for really good intuition gets trampled in the 
stampede. After turning down the hit job, Sapper sensed the change in Mike Han's attitude towards him. I had a feeling this was going wrong, and just a personal feeling. And I said, this smells bad. But anyway, bottom line is, during this period of time while I was there, there was some type of a rift between Michael and I, and I have no idea what it was. But I guarantee you, Michael did. Michael set up a deal for me to go do some stuff. Hand employed Sapper to smuggle 500 watches into Nepal for a friend of his. And as usual, it was to be under the radar. And it went terribly wrong. I was spending two years of my life in a Nepalese prison. <laughs> Frank Nugent's legal problems prompted Mike Hand to upgrade the bank's security. Yes, they used secret codes. Each of the, the members of Nugent Hand had a number. They had a code for various currencies. A US currency was called latex, and they had various other codes for every currency of the world. Fundamentally, they were saying, we are a business that wants to guarantee our clients security and secrecy. That explains why there were very few records. It explains why the codes were there. And Nugent Hand clearly took on board many of the practices that were adopted by the CIA. And it just permeates, I think, through the bank. In the latter half of 1978, Mike Hand, Bernie Houghton and their cohort of military executives took the bank deeper into the clandestine world. Hand recruited General Earl Koch to run the Nugent Hand office in Washington, D.C. Koch had decades of experience moving money for the CIA, the FBI and other U.S. government agencies. The Nugent Hand Bank was soon making a play for a slice of the biggest money-moving exercise of the century. Autumn 1978. Fundamentalism took hold with a fury and a force that helped ignite the still impoverished masses in Iran. Anti-Shah demonstrations had grown to such proportions that the Shah declared martial law in most of Iran's city. With Iran on the verge of revolution, its leader, the Shah of Iran, was preparing to flee and looking for ways of secreting $60 billion out of the country with him. The Swiss banks decided that moving the Shah's money was not only politically dangerous, but akin to moving nitroglycerine along an unsealed road. Nugent Hand, however, saw it as an opportunity to make a killing. Through its new office in Germany, the Nugent Hand Bank began negotiating the deposit of 1.5 billion US dollars of the Shah's loot to its Cayman Islands branch, for which it would earn a commission of seven and a half million dollars. General Ed Black, Nugent Hand's Hawaii representative, had a direct line with the Shah's military staff and carried out some of the negotiations. A tearful Shah of Iran left his country today on a vacation from which he may never return. The Corporate Affairs Commission established the involvement of the Nugent Hand companies in the transfer of funds from Iran, presumably for the later utilisation of the Shah's government in exile. According to a Nugent Hand employee, the bank wasn't satisfied with the agreed commission and kept hundreds of millions of dollars of the Shah's fortune. Gun running was also back on the agenda. Bernie Houghton was hawking everything from uniforms to gunboats throughout the Middle East. Houghton was also courting infamous gun runner Edward P. Wilson. At the time, the former senior CIA officer was wanted by the FBI and would later spend 22 years in prison for supplying tons of plastic explosives to the rogue state of Libya. One person that I guess shows the uh, total lack of morality of this whole operation and the way it works is a former CIA operative named Ed Wilson, who was a freelancer for some of its friends after he left. But he was a guy that Nugent Hand was also happy to deal with. Now, when you have a bank willing to deal with a person like that, with that sort of reputation, it does say a lot about the standard of morality within the organisation. Meanwhile, retired General Ed Black, the bank's Hawaii representative, began brokering the sale of frag bombs and a helicopter squadron to South Africa, despite an international embargo on weapon sales to the apartheid state. But in Sydney, an increasingly paranoid Frank Nugent 
demanded an end to high-risk ventures like arms trading. Frank Nugan sent telexes back to General Black and various other ones. I think I saw one to Michael Hand as well, stating that Nugan Hand did not want to be involved in these types of transactions. At that stage, Nugan had been charged in the Nugan Griffith matter. I think he, he felt that the eye of examination was on the Nugan Hand group. I don't think he wanted to attract any attention to himself, and that was why those telexes were sent overseas. But Frank Nugan was soon embroiled in risky dealings of his own, involving a murderous drug syndicate. After Nugan's arrest for fraud, many of the bank's clients didn't wish to be seen coming or going from the Macquarie Street office. Nugan made arrangements for them to do business at the office of his lawyer, John Aston. Aston's clerk, Brian Alexander, had connections in the corrupt netherworld where criminals and crooked law enforcement officers scratched each other's back. One of Alexander's associations was the notorious Mr Asia Drug Syndicate. In March 1979, John Aston called up Nugan Hand and asked bank director George Shaw to come to his office to pick up a large quantity of money. And it was identified that George Shaw had picked up $260,000. Shaw took the money back to, uh, to the New Macquarie Street premises. 130000 was of the cash was put into Nugan safe. The other 130000 then was washed and found its way overseas and was picked up by Chu Chen Kui. And Kui was a member of the Mr Asia Syndicate. When you looked at the recipient of the money, it was the supplier of the heroin for the Mr Asia Syndicate. The heroin arrived in Sydney and was sold in Sydney. This was probably the largest single amount of money that we identified coming from a major drug importation group. We understand that the Mr Asia Syndicate had put at least $3 million cash through the Nugan Hand Bank. Within days of the money transfer to Singapore, Nugan's lawyer, Aston, deposited $10,000 into a Nugan Hand account in the name of Richard Spencer. Spencer was a senior narcotics bureau officer heading an investigation into the Mr Asia Syndicate. When two former couriers for the syndicate who were in witness protection were murdered, Spencer and law clerk Brian Alexander were arrested on suspicion that they had leaked the courier's whereabouts to the syndicate. For Frank Nugan, it was all getting too close to home. Indeed, a week after the arrests, two senior Narcotics Bureau officers called on Frank Nugan at his Sydney office. We don't know what was said, but it was undoubtedly related to the Mr Asia case. When the officers departed, Nugan called an emergency meeting of the bank's legal staff. He told them that they were to discontinue conducting illegitimate business, and they were to go through the files and find all the secret bank accounts and tell the customers to go elsewhere. Nugent appeared and sounded if he was hallucinating. The tape recording was made of the meeting and allegedly given to Michael Hand by a concerned staffer. The minute Frank Nugent stood up and said to everybody in the room, although according to people that were there, he was drunk. Drunk to the point where he couldn't clap his hand and chew bubblegum. But he was lucid enough to tell them that they were in illegal activities and they needed to get out of it to disassociate themselves. And to anybody that was at that meeting or heard of it, all of a sudden Frank Nugan was becoming a liability. But maybe he thought that, hey, if this shit hit the fan, it was going to be all over him. So he was motivated not only by, I'm sure, some concern for Nugan Hand and for everybody, but he was concerned about what was going to happen to his brand if this thing went south. I think self-preservation was a lot of that motivation. Forty-eight hours later, the bank's international executives flew into Sydney for a Nugent Hand conference held at the Gazebo Hotel in King's Cross. During proceedings, Frank Nugent announced that Admiral Buddy Yates was standing down as Nugent Hand president in favour of Donald Beasley, the former president of the Great American Bank in Miami, and now Nugent Hand's first recruit with any banking experience. Mike Hand welcomed other recruits, including Dale Holgram, who worked for the CIA airline Air America. Retired Air Force Lieutenant General Roy Manor was the former chief of staff 
for the US Pacific Command. And Walt McDonnell was a 25-year veteran of the CIA, who was director of the agency's economic division. Three legal counsels had also been appointed, including none other than William Colby, the former director of the CIA. As a Wall Street Journal reporter later put it, Nugenhand was manned by enough US military and CIA officers to start a small war. During the conference, Frank Nugent spoke on a number of occasions about minimising risk. But Mike Hand and the other speakers gave no indication that they were moving away from illegal or clandestine activities. There was a tape made of that meeting, which I could never understand why anyone wanted taped. The one thing that struck me about the tape was how open they were to a basic admissions that, uh, like, well, where money's concerned, our principles go out the window. We need to legitimise where we can. But even if we were legitimising, we need to understand that our clients don't want particulars and personal records kept. So we have to accommodate that. It was certainly in a setting for potential significant corruption and a disregard for law. And perhaps that explains how so many drug dealers, let alone businessmen who didn't want to pay taxes, but why so many drug dealers would have gone to them. According to one attendee, the tension between Hand and Nugan was palpable. Hearing other people so openly talking about the extent of the corruption within the uh, bank would have placed an awful lot of pressure on Frank Nugan. He, he would have been a man under an awful lot of stress at that time. Nugan wasn't making sense, and I think you'll find that he was irrational at that stage and probably irrational and drunk at that conference. Privately, many of the American executives had complaints about Frank Nugan. General Black was furious about his shutting down of the helicopter sale to South Africa. Admiral Yates said the Filipinos thought Frank was crass after he had turned up at a meeting at a Manila hotel with two Mercedes, which he left out front with their engines idling. Walt McDonald feared that Frank Nugan was unbalanced. Mike Hand suggested that from now on, McDonald should accompany Frank on all overseas business trips. But Bernie Houghton, who was now running the Middle East branches, believed it was time to pull down the shutters on the Sydney office and hightail it out of Australia altogether. For all intents and purposes, Frank Nugan had lost control of the firm. Regardless of what it says in the recipe book, the plot was thickening. At the final session, Mike Hand announced that substantial insurance policies were being taken out on his and Frank's lives to meet any run on the bank that may occur in the event of misadventure. As the delegates repaired to the bar, Nugan followed Hand and another staffer into an ante room. According to the staffer, insults and accusations deteriorated into an isometric tangle of fists and smashed furniture. When Michael instructed people to marginalize Frank Nugan, that was a bad plan because it played into Nugan's dysfunctionality. It's like giving a drunk monkey a hand grenade. It's not, will it go off? It's just, when's it gonna go off? Frank would ring me and say, can you come down tonight? Paul Owens was Frank Nugan's friend at St Andrew's Cathedral. Future looked terrific. We looked like we we're moving down the road for a Christian television uh, show, uh, which the uh, Nugan Bank was going to finance, and uh, everything looked terrific. In late 1979, Paul Owens noticed a marked change in Frank Nugan. He was going around the world. He was flying here and there and coming back, uh, but he lost a lot of weight. He, he seemed very tired, uh, very drained. I just took that as heavy work. The man I knew was a sincere Christian, and I would say to Frank, where will you spend eternity? I said, you've got a choice, and that, that had a dramatic effect on Frank. Where will you spend eternity? In early January 1980, Frank Nugan purchased a military rifle and an axe. A gun and an axe, that's an unusual combination, really. I often thought at the time that perhaps uh, Frank Nugan had purchased the gun for protection. Buying an axe also uh, lends itself to that scenario. 
He then accompanied his family to the United States, where he handed his wife his life insurance policy. After a business trip to Europe, he returned to Sydney. That afternoon, Bernie Houghton arrived at Nugent's office unannounced. And it certainly was unusual, I think, in the sense that Houghton had always professed a dislike for him. I remember Bernie Houghton described him as an angry, offensive, rude, crude man and a bad drunk. So Houghton would have gone there with a the message, Frank, you are in a lot of trouble. Not we're in a lot of trouble, Frank, you're in a lot of trouble. And it certainly would have put pressure on him. The ABC said that he'd been shot dead. And I just couldn't work out, was this a murder? Because I couldn't fathom in my own mind that it would have been a suicide. When I heard that Frank Nugent had died and had allegedly suicided, my immediate response was, I don't believe that. I actually commented to some of my workmates, he, he didn't suicide, someone's murdered him. When you look at the fact he was carrying the list of names of all these drug traffickers who were a major risk to him, and the names of the former head of the CIA, who does have a reputation for killing people when the need arises, it may well be that it, what he was simply saying, these are the people who I see as the biggest threat to my life. Now, whether he killed himself or someone else killed him is still another question. Nugent Hand's Sydney office reopened two days after Nugent's death. The scene was one of chaos. Staffers were in shock, some were crying. The phones were running hot and concerned depositors were lining up at reception, demanding to know if their money was safe. The bank's international executives were also phoning in, asking what to tell their customers. Mid-morning, Mike Hand and outgoing Nugent Hand president Buddy Yates arrived from London. Half an hour later, Frank's wife, Lee, arrived from the United States she was ushered into the boardroom, crying and demanding answers as to what had happened to her husband. Mike Hand called the staff together. There were no heartfelt speeches about his friend and business partner. He scanned those assembled and warned them that if they didn't cooperate, their wives would be seized, cut up and returned to them in brown paper parcels. After Nugent's death, the bank entered this almost twilight zone of absolute paranoia and who's at risk. Also, they would have been saying, if we are at risk, what have we got to do to minimise that risk? That means we've got to get rid of the records. Over the next three weeks, staff shredded bank records and moved boxes of sensitive documents to locations across the city. There was virtually nothing left in a bank which is amazing. You know, there were no accounts, there were no documents that could be looked at of any significance. And that gave us great suspicion that something awful was happening in that bank. Attorney General Frank Walker tasked the corporate affairs investigators to seize the bank's records from its international branches. They were lucky. The Hong Kong police impounded the books of the Hong Kong branch of the Nugent Hand Bank. And that was the big breakthrough. I sent investigators immediately from Australia to Hong Kong to look through the accounts. Uh, we discovered names in the books that were obviously drug dealers and we gained a very strong impression that the Nugent Hand Bank was in fact a financier of the drug trade, not only to Australia, but around the world. Rick Porter and his colleagues found Mike Hand at the Singapore branch. Michael Hand had beautiful offices there and all the furniture was rosewood. And when we asked him, could we look at certain records, he said they were locked in the Rosewood cabinet. And at that time, he'd, he'd been away skiing for a weekend and he had his, his leg in a cask. And we pressed it and said, well, look, we're only here for a few days. We really need these records. And with that, he, he got angry and he swung his leg around with the cask on it and put it straight through the front of the, the Rosewood cabinet and said, help yourself. When news reached Saudi Arabia of Nugent Hand's problems, Bernie Houghton's staff flew out of the country. More than 100 Americans working in Saudi lost their deposits. Reports later came back that local investors attacked the bank's offices with stones. Calm only settled when US Air Force officers turned up to guard the Nugent Hand establishments. The Singapore police arrested the local staff, but by then Michael Hand and his foreign employees had left the country. 
Hand returned to Australia to quietly wind up the company and appear at the coroner's inquest into Nugent's death. Well, I was the, uh, the sergeant assisting the coroner in the inquest. At that time, we had no idea he had connections with the CIA and we had no idea what his, his real background was. When he was in the witness box, he presented as an extremely intelligent individual. You could almost hear his mind ticking over as he was answering questions. He would give a very well-delivered and well-thought-out answer. An example of this was when I said to him, Mr Hand, there's $8 million missing from the Nugent Hand Bank. Do you have any idea what happened to that money? And he just looked me straight in the eye and he said, Frank Nugent stole it. <laughs> it, was, it was an extraordinary statement. He's nominated the only person that's not around to defend himself. And uh, I suppose that, that, was, that was one way of looking at it. Perhaps with an eye to reaping millions from the insurance policies on Nugent's life, Michael Hand told the coroner that he believed Frank Nugent had been murdered. There was a lot of pressure on one side to find that Frank Nugent suicided and there was a lot of pressure on the other side that people didn't want it to be suicide because there was three $1 million insurance policies and two of them, I believe, were within the 13 months period so they wouldn't be paid out if it was suicide. But after hearing the testimonies of witnesses, the coroner came to the conclusion that Nugan had taken his own life. It's certainly the most extraordinary inquest that I've ever done. In the intervening years, Sergeant Cole Wedderburn, who assisted the coroner, has pondered over evidence that was not fully explored at the inquest. Evidence that points to a far more sinister conclusion. When all the evidence is taken in this matter, in the inquest, there were only three possibilities. One, there was an accident. Two, it was suicide. Three, it was murder. And I believe the fourth one is the fact. Frank Nugent didn't voluntarily, within the meaning of voluntarily, pull that trigger. Now, amongst his property was a Bible they found in the car. And in the Bible, it was indicated to me that there were certain passages, sentences and words that were underlined. Wife, children, death. And I drew the inference from that, that personal persons were a serious threat to his wife and children. Someone through coercion and other means has caused him to commit suicide. coming up in part four of Merchants of Menace. Well, I was uh, contacted in a matter of urgency in Orange from the chief of the CIB. He said to me, uh, Billy, who have you got in Frank Newton's grave? This was a great example of a magician doing a card trick. Here's a mustache, change your hair color, click, click, right to the airport. This podcast is derived from the book Merchants of Menace, The True Story of the Nugan Hand Bank Scandal, available at www.merchantsofmenace.net. Welcome to ACAST Recommends. Every week, we pick some of our favorite shows, and this is one we think you're going to love. We are gathered here today at Dive Studio to introduce... A brand new podcast! Podcast! <laughs> boop, 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 boop. Which is titled Get Real, Get hosted Real. by BM from Card, which is me. Ashley, you might know me from Ladies Code. And Peniel from B2B. We're here not only as K-pop stars, but as three really good friends. There are going to be a lot of personal stories. <laughs> Up to the point where it won't ruin our careers. <laughs> <laughs> Acast is home to the biggest podcasts from Australia and around the world. Subscribe to this show and hundreds more now via Acast or wherever you get your podcasts.